and others against BHP Group PLC and others. Yes, Mr. Dunning. <coughs> My Lords, I appear together with Mr. Mercer, Queen's Counsel, uh, Mr. Harrison, Mr. McDonough, who are in court, and Mr. Hopkins, who is on the live stream. We represent some 200,000 Brazilian individuals, as well as businesses, faith-based institutions, municipalities, utility entities, and an entire ethnic group living in the affected region called the Cranach claimants. And my learned friends, Mr. Gibson, Queen's Council, Mr. Toledano, Queen's Council, Ms. Fatima, Queen's Council, and Mr. Svobodna appear for the defendants, who are the two joint parent companies of the well-known BHP mining group. And my lords, this is my application under CPR 52.30, to reopen Lord Justice Coulson's decision to dismiss the application for permission to appeal against the judgment of Mr. Justice Turner in this case. My Lord, um, Lord Justice Coulson made that decision on the 23rd of March. Uh, the original permission to appeal application was contained in grounds which are in tab six of bundle A, supported by a skeleton argument which is in tab eight of bundle A, both of those documents are dated the 16th of February 2021. There is then, following Lord Justice Coulson's decision on the 23rd of March, a separate skeleton argument for this application, which is in bundle A at tab 3, dated the 20th of April. And my Lord, the starting point is obviously <coughs> CPR 5230 and the law on that. And I have, if I may, Yes. Boil it down to five propositions, which I would like to give you, first of all. Okay, well, you give me your five propositions, and then perhaps I'll set out some parameters for the hearing. Well, of course, my Lord, I'm happy to, but, to, to wait, but I, the five propositions I hope will not well, be let, controversial. Well, let, let's yeah. hear them. Yeah. So the five propositions are, are these. Firstly, the jurisdiction under 5230, the CPR, is exceptional and only arises where there is something which has, quotes, undermined the integrity of the process, end quote. Second yeah. proposition. Is that in the context of a mission to appeal application, a PTA application, the integrity of the PTA process will be treated as having been undermined if either A, the Lord Justice who has dealt with the matter on paper, has wholly failed to grapple with the essential issues. Or B, if although he or she has grappled with them, they have made an exceptional mistake, such as failing to understand a ground which was clearly articulated, so that the paper PTA process was corrupted. And, and those are those those that part is taken almost word for word from the decision in Wingfield. I'll come back to the, the four leading cases in a moment, but at paragraph 66. Yes. And the third proposition, my lord, is that the, quote, essential issues, which have to be grappled with and addressed, are the issues on which the determination of the relevant application depends. Here, that's the permission to appeal application. So that um, it doesn't have to be shown that the appeal would succeed, but only that the permission to appeal application should have succeeded. Or 
fourth proposition, my lord, and this um, is taken from paragraph 35 in the case called Goring, and I'll give you the full references in a moment, and Wasif, which my lord, Lord Justice Underhill gave the um, leading judgment at Goring at paragraph 35 and Wasif at paragraphs 20 and 66. The, the, this is the fourth proposition. As to the extent of reasons required to show that the Lord Justice grappled with the essential issues, it may of course be possible and indeed desirable to dispose of the grounds shortly. But what is necessary depends on the individual facts of each case. But, but whatever the guiding principle is that all the claimants' essential points must be identified and addressed. And in relation to each of these essential points, it must be explained why an appeal on that point has no realistic prospect of success. And again, that's taken almost directly from paragraph 20, Wasif, Justice Underhill, and, and which he applied and repeated at paragraph 66, and it's then been adopted in the Goring case. And the fifth proposition, my lord, is that the, in addition, the applicant has to show a powerful probability that the decision would have been different if the integrity of the process had not been undermined in the way that I've just described. Now, I, I hope that that won't be too controversial, but that, can I just summarize where I have taken those propositions from? Well, I don't think you need to do that, because okay. we've done a lot of pre-reading, uh, Mr. Dunning. And I wanted to try and short-circuit some of these questions. Um, there are a couple of things that you should know. We allocated two hours for this case, but we regard it of such importance that we're prepared to go longer if that is necessary, with an absolute limit of 4.15 this afternoon. Yes. Well, my lord, I th if I may say this, I do think it is necessary. Well. Um, I'm going to leave it to the good sense of counsel um, to uh, having heard what else I've got to say um, decide, but um, obviously you will need to leave a, a proper opportunity for the respondents to respond. Yes. Um, the second point is this, that we would we consider um, provisionally that if we were to think this was such an exceptional case that um, uh, we should uh, reconsider, that we should also uh, decide the question of permission to appeal. And our provisional view is that had we been considering the matter, permission to appeal would have been granted. Yes. And obviously that's much more um, a point for um, Mr. Gibson, in the sense that he obviously must have a full opportunity to persuade us that that is uh, a completely uh, wrong yes. view. Uh, but we would like you to concentrate on the, the first part, which is what you've done in your five propositions, if I may say so, um, and in particular on an analysis of why you say the judge failed to grapple with essential parts of your grounds of appeal. Yes. And that, as we see the case, is absolutely central, because if you can't get over that hurdle, uh, then finality will prevail, and you don't get through the gateway, whatever we think about permission to appeal. That's all understood, my lord, and that, that is, I believe, the approach that I was planning um, and um, but, but just for the record, as one sometimes says, could I just say those propositions yes. are accepted for the purpose of today, um, and because there are, they are binding decisions of the Court of Appeal, I do wish to just formally. I mean, are they are they propositions? I, I, 
I can't recall having seen them put like that. And it would certainly help me if I had them in a document um, set out with the references. Um, you've got plenty of juniors, so I expect that can be done. Yes. I, mean, I could do it equally very briefly now, but I, I'll, I'll move on. I'll move on. We'll do it in a document. Yes. Well, you, you can, can I just, just say put it in a document and send on, it electronically? On the reservation, I don't want to spend too much time on this, but if the matter were to go elsewhere, then we do reserve the position that either 5230 is um, impermissibly narrow under Article 6, or that the way it's been interpreted is impermissibly narrow. And we, um, it is the fact that the, that the Supreme Court doesn't, isn't bound by 5230, but does have a similar jurisdiction, which it invoked in a case called the Chagos case, 2016 UKSC 35, where we would submit that if one looks at the reasons, paragraphs five to six in that case, it does, the, the Supreme Court actually applied a less strict test to its own jurisdiction. Now, I'm not challenging, uh, all I'm saying is these are reservations, my Lord. For the present purposes, I'm quite content to proceed on the basis of the four cases where I've taken those propositions from, which are Barclays Bank and Guy, Wasif, um, so Barclays Bank and Guy, Authorities Bundle 1 at Tab 2. You don't need to give us the references okay. um, at every um, stage. Barclays Bank and Guy, Wasif, Goring, and Wingfield. Um, they're all in part one of the, the, of the bundle. But the, I just wanted to put down that, that mark. Now, well, um, the Lord will forgive me. I wouldn't mind knowing in a sentence or two, and I literally mean in a sentence or two, what are the respects in which you say the case law of this court has misinterpreted 5230 and or, I forget where you put it was misinterpreted 5230, um, so that we can see which are the bits that you say are dodgy in that case law. I'm not saying they're dodgy for today's purposes. Sir. No, I know, but I would just like to know, without you developing, I'm sorry. what are the points? Yes, I, the, the points are these. Um, that the, the, the first point is that when the, the Supreme Court has considered the analogous position in the Chagos <coughs> Highlanders case, which is... Um, you said that, yes. Yeah, um, and um, they have applied what seems to be a less strict test. Yeah, but less strict in what? What are the bits that are too strict in the case law that you have accepted for the same purpose of this appeal? If it's not easy to do straight away, don't do it. I just thought you obviously had some points in mind. I wouldn't have minded knowing what they were. Well, <coughs> um, we say that the, the, the Goring-Wingfield test goes beyond the test that the Supreme Court has laid down. I see, okay, well. Um, and that it, 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 as Goring, sorry, Wingfield said at paragraph 62, the Court of Appeal in, in Wingfield, which was, cons you will, you'll have read them, you know who it consisted yeah. of, but the Court of Appeal in that case, at paragraph 62, actually said that these requirements are almost impossible to meet. Yes. Um, and that is um, quite a... So that's one bit you'd wish to that, challenge. Yes. Yeah. And, and the, the other point is this, that, that what has happened is we've gone to an entirely paper-based system for um, applications for permission to appear with no right, no right to renew, which was, which was abolished on the 2nd of October 2016, I believe. Yes. Um, and um, prior to that, of course, the, it, it, it did make sense to have the same test for appeals as there were for permissions to appeal, because the, any permission to appeal would, if the applicant wanted it, have been determined finally after an oral hearing. But we have now gone to an, an entirely paper-based system, um, and subject, obviously, to the 5230 um, requirement. If one then imposes as 5230 requirement something which the Court of Appeal says is almost impossible to meet, paragraph 62 in Wingfield, that um, is a very um, high and uh, almost impossible uh, threshold to meet. Can and I just ask you this, Mr. Dunning? Are, are we getting a transcript of these this hearing? I believe yes. It's, it's, there's a live transcript, actually, my lord. I don't know. Yes. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. I've got it here. 
<laughs> Sorry, but we're going to get it. We're going to get it in. Um, we, we're going to get a hard copy or a, of course. a, a soft of course. copy in due course. And, and the final point, my lord, in, just for your, your note, <laughs> is that, in so far as the Court of Appeal, and this is not for today's purposes, I just stress. Yeah, you've you said that. that. I just. That insofar as that the Court of Appeal has held that the whole process has to be corrupted or the integrity of the process has to be un undermined, that is inconsistent with Article 6 of the European um, Convention on Human Rights, where the relevant authority establishes that the court should be concerned with the balancing of interests in providing adequate reasons with the interest in the finality and mitigation. So, the, so there are... There are those four points that I've that I In the Chagos Island case in the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court was simply dealing with the discretionary power under its inherent jurisdiction exactly. to reopen. So yes. it wasn't constrained by the words of 52.30, the exactly. express, uh, express need for exceptionality. Exactly. Yeah. And I entirely accept that. But in, in so far as it was, it was laying down a test, um, which it thought was the right and fair test to apply in light of the Human Rights Act and so on, it, it laid down a weaker test than the test that is derived from a the significant court. injustice has probably occurred. Yes. And no alternative remedy. And no alternative remedy. Whereas the test from the on the four cases <laughs> is which I'm trying to meet today, is that the whole process has been corrupted or the integrity of the process has been undermined, albeit that can be in the sense that important reasons have been overlooked or misunderstood and hence they have not been grappled with, and hence, to come back to, to what my Lord Lord Justice Underhill said in the Massif case, there hasn't been an articulation of a reason why that a particular ground, or even more than one ground, as it is the case here, should be regarded as having no prospect of success. And my Lord, what, what I understood from your judgment in that case Paragraph twenty of the court. Yes, of course. Yes. yes. The court's judgment in that case was that it is not enough for the judge to make conclusory remarks such as "this is obviously wrong" or "I" you know, or "it's misconceived." There has to be something, and that's what you actually said in paragraph. That's why I referred to paragraph sixty-six, my lord, in, in that case. Sixty-six in Wesif. Yes. And that's um, I think one has to look at twenty first, and presumably you have, but just to be clear, because what comes in sixty six is um, follows on from the statement of the law in twenty. Um, what I said in my propositions was very largely modelled in part on paragraph twenty, which is tab four of the bundle. And in the point I've just well, been making... I think you really actually... I, I get that you actually want 19 first, don't you? Well, we in do want sense, it, it makes a point that you've just made about reasons having possibly to be fuller where it's the end of the road. Yes. Obviously, the, the, it's, it's if the person's losing that they need to, to know, and, and that is the end of the road for them, that they really need to know what and have explained to them why there are things which have been settled, in this case, I think, by seven counsel um, of the grounds of appeal, um, are misconceived or hopelessly wrong or, or, or various other adjectives that were used by Lord Justice Coulson. Um, and, and, and I was picking up in particular, just below, well, in between G and H there, um, obviously, the, it, it, there's the point about what is necessary depends on the case. All the claimant's points must be identified and addressed. Um, it is the judge's responsibility to analyze them into component parts and say why each fails to give the claimant a realistic prospect of success, unless the case is one where disposing of one ground renders it unnecessary to consider the others. And then you, the, uh, the other point I make, you don't actually use the word conclusory, but in paragraph 66, the, right at the end, right, or the court says, we fear, however, that we must again be critical of the adequacy of the judge's expressed reasoning, and indeed, if read, did not seek to defend it. 
The reasoning, that reasoning was in effect that Mr. Hussain's grounds do no more than assert his case on insurmountable obstacles, including because of the alleged risk of political persecution with a degree of exaggeration and disagree with the Secretary of State's decision. That is not enough. A claimant necessarily asserts his or her case and disagrees with the decision challenged. But Mr. Hussain gave reasons for doing so, and it was necessary for the judge to say why those reasons had no realistic prospect of success, all the more so where the application was said to be totally without merit. Now, my lord, I'm going to come back to the rules put to me. I'm going to try to do this in two stages. First of all, to summarize the points without going to the document, but to summarize for you the points that we say were not properly addressed. I don't want to keep repeating every time, grappled with or didn't give reasons. Mr. Dunning, my concern, if I can just express it, is as to substance rather than form. I completely understand that the judge dealt with stuff that makes it look as if he certainly paid too much attention to the judge's petition permission to appeal judgment rather than your grounds. But in a sense, that only adds up, if I can put it colloquially, to a row of beans if substantively he failed to grapple with points that you were making. And what I want you to try to do is explain to the court why he did that and in what substantive respects. And then, of course, it will be for Mr. Gibson to say why you're wrong. Manuel, that is exactly the point. We are not relying on the fact that he, for example, dismissed the at-a-glance argument as hopeless. Well, you are relying on it. It wasn't advanced to him. No, exactly. It perhaps adds some color, but the main point is the substantive points. And can I now summarize? So what I was going to do is summarize the points but then take you to my comparison document, which I hope you received. Yes. And the idea will be to look at that in conjunction with each of the grounds one by one. But before I do that, and hopefully this will be convenient, I will try to summarize the points I'm going to be making. And the first and possibly the single most important point, but not by any means the only important point, is that the judge did not deal with what is to be found in ground one at paragraph two and ground four at paragraphs 12 to 13. Sorry, could you say that again? I was trying to get my transcript to start working and I failed. Just say that again. So there are five points coming, and this is the first. Not grappling with ground one, paragraph two, which is then the point that is developed in ground four at paragraphs 12 and 13 of the grounds. And five? Is it not also developed in five? It is, but that's a separate point. So I was going to deal with that separately. I'm trying to group them. Now, this is, as I say, the single most important point because this is... Can I just ask, sorry, I'm sorry to be so awkward. What's the search session code for this thing? Because my screen's gone off. Does anybody know the session code? No, no, no. Transcribers will probably be listening and they can probably email counsel who can tell you. Okay, it would help me because getting all these numbers down is just a bit time-consuming. Okay. I apologize for that, my lord. Now, so it's ground one, paragraph two, and ground four. Yeah. And this is where the supposed fact that the proceedings should be struck out as, quote, irredeemably unmanageable was attacked as being not a proper basis on which to strike out. 
strike out uh, a proceeding. And just for the reference, the, in his permission to appeal judgment, the learned judge at first instance, at paragraph 67 to 70, said this was his central finding. On which power is right? 67 to 70 of his permission to appeal judgment. And he said this was his central finding there, on which he alone he had decided that the case should be struck out. And the, the simple point is that when one looks at the relevant parts of Lord Justice Coulson's reasons, which are paragraphs 6 to 8 and paragraph 12, they do not address the ground, which is that this approach creates an impermissible barrier to the access to the court. In other words, to apply the test of unmanageability and, and the barrier that that would erect to access to the court. He simply doesn't address this point in the relevant paragraphs of his reasons, which are 6 to 8 and paragraph 12. And in addition, there is an important point about case management and, and striking out for an abuse. And that is that strike out is a draconian remedy. And before striking out because a case would be unmanageable, in any event, it would be necessary to consider less draconian measures, um, as one would always do under the CPR. And there was a separate point made that the less draconian measure would have been to require any claimants who were in fact claiming in Brazil, and that was not the majority, the majority of the claimants are not claiming against anyone in Brazil. Um, and there are no proceedings against these defendants in Brazil. But the, insofar as let's say 25%, but it may not be as many as that, but let's say that percentage of claimants are pursuing proceedings against someone else in Brazil, not against these defendants. They could be, if it was necessary, because that, that, that risked making the case unmanageable, they could be required to elect to um, discontinue their Brazilian proceedings. That, that's equating unmanageability with the problems arising out of potential irreconcilable judgments. I mean, is that a problem? Is that the right way of looking at manageability? Isn't that no. something separate? We say it isn't the right way of looking at it. But even if one buys into the judges, because this is the reason why, he, this is one of the reasons why he held the case was fundamentally or irredeemably unmanageable, namely that there was a risk of cross-contamination of judgments. And we say that that, can be elimin that risk could be eliminated what? by requiring an election. Two and details is I, I must say I didn't quite understand what was meant by cross contamination, and I, if I'm, I think you've, if, with respect, slightly made it worse by talking about cross contamination of judgments. But in fact, I judge you regularly use two phrases: irreconcilable judgments, which I do understand, and cross contamination, which seems to be something different from irreconcilable judgments, which I have more difficulty. Okay. Uh, probably everyone else understood it, but I don't. On repeated well, well, judgments. Um, so my point is simply this, that strikeout is a very draconian relief. He could and should have considered, and this, is, this, is, this also was not addressed by Lord Justice Coulson, he could and should have considered what other case management techniques existed to eliminate either the risk of inconsistent judgments or the risk of cross-contamination, <coughs> however one puts it. Because I, I, Come back to the fact that there are no proceedings in Brazil against these defendants. Yeah. There are some claimants, maybe 25%, but definitely the minority, who are bringing proceedings in Brazil against other parties. And so you've got the bulk of the claimants here who are bringing no proceedings in Brazil, and yet they're entire action has been struck out as an abuse because some of the claimants have brought proceedings in Brazil which they could be required 
to elect to discontinue. I mean, we've, we've, we've got that. Yeah. Uh, okay. And we understand the well, position as to what where claimants and defendants are joined. I, I'm just very keen to keep you to your five substantive yep. points that you're summarising because they're going to help us decide whether the judge truly okay. went wrong. Well, so, so, and by the way, the, just to just to clarify the the transcript, the transcript is coming off the live stream, so it's 90 seconds behind, which is why I started, um, which is why I started fiddling with it. Um, of course, we're never going to have a satisfactory live transcript, so I shall now ignore my um, iPad and listen to you, Mr. Dunning. I'm sorry, I haven't, I haven't even looked at it. My Lord, Thank you very much. But so, to, to just boil down, the, the, the simple point of the first point, and I'll move on to the next one, is ground one, paragraph two, and ground four have not been addressed by Lord Justice Corset. Yes. And these are very important um, points. Um, and they, they have been developed in our, um, in our skeleton argument for the purpose of both the appeal and also for the purpose of this application. We say it's an, it's an overriding importance at common law and under Article 6 that the claimant should have under, unhindered right of access as, as, as recognized by the Supreme Court in the Unison case. And we in particular relied, when we sought permission to appeal from Lord Justice Coulson, on what Lord Briggs had said in MasterCard and Merricks, which was not available until, I think, December, which is that serious case management difficulties can, in a, in a large class cannot justify a denial of access to justice. And that was paragraphs 73 and 74 of Lord Briggs in Merricks. And so that was... Aren't you resisting the... Yeah, I'm not sure you're totally resisting the temptation not just to tell us what your submissions are, but to okay. no, you're, you're develop them. You're, you're right, my lord. <laughs> I'll go on to the second point. I'll go on to the second so the, the first point is access to justice in Article Six. The second point is, and that's what I'm just saying is the the first point includes Mastercard, the Mastercard yes. and Merrick's point. Yeah. Second point is ground two at paragraph six, and ground one at paragraph one, and ground three at paragraphs nine to eleven. Hang on, ground what? Ground two at paragraph six, which is to be read together with ground one at paragraph one, and ground three at paragraphs nine to eleven. Do you think you could be accused of having complicated your case rather? My lord, I think that there is some fairness in that, but it is a very difficult judgment to attack because of the way it is, it is structured. That's all I would say. I don't, I, it's, it's, I don't know if it's... If I can just get this off my chest, doing permission to appeal applications on the papers, you work from the grounds, and each ground ought to be a separate proposition of law. Yeah. We had here 15 grounds, one of which started, several of which started with just some general heading, unlawful, novel, doesn't help you at all. That's then discursively developed in many sub-paragraphs or paragraphs without often descending into particular precise propositions, reading much more like a skeleton argument. Uh, and that's somewhat, to some extent recognised in the supporting permission to appeal, which actually reorganises them all and deals with them in a different order rather like you're doing now, picking up a paragraph here and a paragraph there. Speaking for myself, I have a lot of sympathy with the judge. He wanted to proceed. He got 15 rounds. I'll deal with each of them in turn. But actually, he had to pick and match between them, you're saying, really to get your essential points. And I think one lesson to be learned from this, whatever the outcome is, that rounds should be concisely and precisely pleaded in propositions saying what the error is, and uh, then uh, the uh, uh, developed as discursively as you like, within reason, in the skeleton arguments. There's a cross-contamination between grounds and skeleton arguments, which I'm sure the judge found unhelpful, and um, I've also had some difficulty with. 
Now I've got that off my chest, but at least you have oh, a chance I, to answer it. Well, I, I, won't, answer, I won't answer, my lord. I see the, I see the force of that point, but... Um, uh, can, can, can I, anyway, can I, can right, I don't on answer on it then. So quite I, that, it, ground two, para six, to be read with ground one, para one, and then there was also and, ground... And ground three at paragraphs nine to eleven. And th this is the, the... The essential point is here, and it's the point, I think, that uh, was being put to me a moment ago, it's, which is that the judge is not asking the right question in this context, because he's not asking whether the proceedings are inherently abusive, viewed at as a, as a self-contained set of proceedings. But he's instead, in substance, posed, and I'm talking about Mr. Just, Lord Justice, Mr. Justice Turner here, he instead, in substance, he has posed a different question, whether it's abusive to choose an English forum over a Brazilian forum due to the risk of irreconcilable judgments. And we say that, that the learned judge took the wrong approach in relation to that because the result is that one doesn't apply the mandatory jurisdiction of the court over UK domiciled companies um, in Article 4 of the Brussels Recast Regulation, as was explained by Lord Briggs in Vedanta. And, it, and indeed, it's, it's paragraph one of the headnote in Vedanta in the Supreme Court that the, the overriding right e to sue uh, a do an English domiciled company in England. And so by, by saying that, that, that you can strike out as an abuse a proceeding which is against an English domicile company um, brought in England, served as of right, because there are some proceedings against other parties in Brazil, is, is novel and contrary to the mandatory provisions of Article, Article 4. And, and, and so far as the other defendant, the Australian defendant, concerned. It's also contrary to the guidance of Lord Goff in Spiliada, at, um, although he wasn't obviously grappling with quite the same situation, but in particular pages 474 to 478 in the judgment of Lord Goff. Because what you're, what you're, <coughs> what you're doing is you're looking at proceedings between other parties in Brazil, and you're not asking where can this case be suitably tried for the ends of justice between these parties? Which was, the, which was Lord Goff's fundamental test. <coughs> so, Isn't that step two? Your first point is whether as a matter of principle these are relevant considerations for the question of manageability and abuse. If you're wrong about that, then you would further say on the facts here it doesn't work. No, this third point is still a matter of principle because... Mm -hmm we say that striking out as an abuse over the choice of a forum where there are, in a different forum, other proceedings between other parties is, is, is creating a novel category of abuse which runs counter to the principle of Article 4 of the Recast Regulation and counter to so far as the Australian company is concerned, conventional forum convenience principles. Now, so that, that, that ground, uh, Lord Justice Coulson attempted to address in paragraph six, but he did not offer any explanation as to why it was not arguable. Um, he was disparaging about it, but he didn't engage with um, the argument and explain why it was wrong. Because one, in terms of the substance, one has to think about what is the consequence of saying that you can ignore Article 4 and you can ignore Artic and, and foreign convenience principles and strike out a choice of bringing proceedings in, in a particular country against a domiciled person here who you have a right to sue here, 
just regard that as abusive because there are proceedings elsewhere between other parties. That's the number, that's the number for that point. Um, my Lord, the third point is ground two at paragraph seven to eight. Um, now, this, this is on the facts uh, in, in, in response to the last question. Lady. Um, the ground two at paragraphs seven to eight says that the, there was a demonstrable misunderstanding of the evidence, and with most of which was largely common ground, in fact, in, relation, in, the, in the key points. As a result of which, um, the uh, judge held in various paragraphs that there was a risk of um, irreconcilable judgments or cross-contamination of the English proceedings by the Brazilian proceedings. But the, the key points that are identified in this ground are, and, I, and I, I have mentioned them already, but just to summarize them, none of the claimants is a party to the 155BN CPA. None of um, them is seeking any remedy in that CPA. And indeed, that's not how a CPA works. It doesn't decide the quantum of claims of individual claimants. Most of the claimants have not brought any proceedings in Brazil. And none of them have brought any proceedings against these two defendants. So, what, what Sorry, really... How you say the key points. One was none of the claimants is a party. To the, to the CPA. To the CPA. Right, yeah. None of them is seeking a remedy in that CPA. Is that the second point? Yeah, and indeed they can't because it's... Well, hang on, wait a minute. Yeah. Hang on, that's really the first point, isn't it? If they're not parties, they can't be seeking a remedy. I'm just trying to yes. be systematic about this. Yes. No, I, I, uh, uh, it, none of them will have any remedy of their own. That CPA isn't is this the point? The none, of the, one of, none of them are parties to the CPA. Yeah. Uh, only some of them are bringing proceedings of their own. It, what, it, what there else? is a more. There is a. There is another point in the middle, which is <clears> though <throat> that proceeding, the one five five CPA, is brought by the federal prosecutor, it uh, it can only establish liability. It can't determine any of their claims so of, of loss. It's yes, that's simply not part. That's what I was really trying to get at as a second point. So a remedy in the CPA. The, well, there's no remedy in the CPA. It, it, it deals with liability and it's an action brought by the federal prosecutor. I understood it was a remedy. Uh, and what the result then if it's, uh, is, is the establishment of a fund on which... No. Well, no, that, only, that can only happen voluntarily. There so is how, when, just help me on this, when the prosecutor succeeds in the 155 billion CPA, if it happens and if he does, um, how does that result in payments to uh, victims? It doesn't, not on its own, that's my point. Well, I mean, okay, but yeah. then how do they get Well, they then have to bring don't. their own claim um, um, Relying on the finding of life. Yes, I see. Thank you. There is potentially an important point if you look at seventy-eight of uh, Miss Justice Turner's judgment, yes. and you you say that there's a striking sentence. Um, most distinctive features, action in England would involve you know, parallel claims with many of the same claimants seeking identical remedies concurrently. Can you say that was a fundamental error of fact and absolutely. not grappled with by Lord Justice Coulson? Yes, I do. Absolutely. That's exactly the point. It, 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 the I was going to give the paragraph. So you're, you're right, it's 78. It's also 141 and 181. Um, and the, those paragraphs contain fundamental misunderstanding of the evidence and indeed of what was common ground. 
Um, sorry, just to go back, that, so that was the second point. The third point was that most of the claimants have not brought any proceedings in Brazil, my lord, Justice Underhill. And the fourth point was that none of them have brought any proceedings against these two defendants. There are no proceedings against these two defendants. But wasn't the judge's fundamental point this? That if the system works, you've got all sorts of reasons for saying it doesn't work, but if the system works, the end result will be a finding of liability in the uh, CPA, opening the door to a series of individual claims in Brazil where liability will not be an issue because that has been decided in the CPA, and uh, uh, remedy claims involving issues both of quantum and causation uh, will be decided in the Brazilian courts. Isn't that what he said would give risk to the irre irreconcilable judge? It doesn't matter. Well, it, it's only a matter. It's a procedural oddity of the Brazil that they're not formally parties to the CPA, but they are ultimate beneficiaries of it. And the point of the CPA is that at the end of the day, their claims will be facilitated. Yes, but 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 even taking that, that trip down to that, which I, I I see the point. But why does that make it an abuse? For them to sue. To, no, the other point is that the CPA will decide nothing against these defendants. So the C, these defendants are not party to the CPA. They're and not. You, you had expert evidence saying it wasn't binding. Well, the Brazilian judgment would be, would be binding. binding. They're not. They're not affected yeah. by it at all. Yes. They're not. They're not involved in it. So that. So that the claims that, that, that you've just described, my lord, just under the correctly as stripped down to its essential, but would only be claims against third parties. <coughs> They're not claims against th these defendants, because the CPA, the 155 CPA is not going to decide the liability of these two defendants. And the issues relating to these two defendants, one, for example, being an indirect polluter or not, would turn e exclusively on the structure of these companies, their involvement, their knowledge, et cetera, et cetera. Is Either exclusively or very largely. Let, let's put it like that, because, because because I don't want to put it too no, no. too highly, and then Mr. Mr. Gibson comes back no, and I says understand. that's wrong. But it would involve but, but, additional but, and or different. But the, I don't know whether you've had a chance to look at the pleading on liability, which we identified in the reading list. But the but just summarising it briefly, these two companies are the joint parent companies. They operate. As a, as a unit, they have one management committee for the Australian and the English company. And that management committee, we say, had the relevant knowledge um, of the risks of continuing to build up the dam without taking proper precautions. And they took that risk, and that is sufficient for them to be liable as indirect polluters under Brazilian law. That's all pleaded in the in the master particulars of claim. And yes, so that that issue is not going to be decided in the 155 CPA because these two defendants are not party to that proceeding. They're not party to any relevant proceedings in Brazil. And this is this is the fundamental um, point that the judge one doesn't get this from reading the judge's reasons. One would think reading the judge's reasons, and he indeed he says this that that my clients my clients have chosen to bring duplicatory proceedings here and in Brazil, but that is that is simply not true. Because most of my clients have not brought any proceedings in Brazil, and no one has, none of them have brought any proceedings against these defendants. And so far as the CPA is concerned, that will not decide anything about these defendants. Even though Lord Justice Underhill is right that, that my clients could take advantage of it in the future if there's ever a decision in the 155 CPA. And it, it, just on that, I think that this is more relevant for Article 4, but on, but on that, my lord, the, the fact, the fact un, undoubted fact, is that this, the 155 CPA has been stayed since January 2017. It was 
common ground last July that it would remain stayed for at least another two years. It was then disputed whether it might ever revive. But if it did revive, it would take two to four years to be resolved. And then, of course, there would be the possibility of appeals. But this, but that, but that, and then it, then it won't decide anything as against these two defendants, even at the end of that process. And, it, and um, e even though my clients could potentially take advantage of it. Well, I suppose there's a point the that if, if the clients are fully compensated in Brazil by the CPA process, uh, then they can't obtain double recovery even against another defendant. But then, uh, that, that is, that, uh, I accept that, and no one's, no one's saying, but that's just something you deal with in case management. You just make, make, make you just, when you, in all these group actions this comes up, mm. just, let's just take the sensor pipeline case in, in Colombia against, um, which my, my local <laughs> Mr. Gibson was in. Um, you, there was an issue there whether the Colombian farmers had already accepted compensation and settled their claims. That didn't lead anyone to say, hang on, this is an abuse, we just strike it out, we won't even try this case. No, we, well... We, uh, we, they, they, it was just an issue amongst the different lead cases that were, that were tried and determined by Ms. Justice well, Smith. As Mr. Said. Dunning, rather than get into the weeds of that case, or indeed this case, um, can we just keep going with the five points yeah. Yeah. That, that, uh, that, that he didn't but, grapple with? Uh, so, so that, that I don't put you off your... We are, this is a classic halfway house, you trail the points and then half make them. Are we, you see, at some point we haven't yet looked how this, no. you've said, oh, Lord Justice Toulson doesn't deal with this, but you haven't taken us to where well, he does deal with it. That's are you, you're going to do that all that later, are you? Well, I was going to, my Lord. Yeah, no, that's fine, that's fine, but all the more reason then just to be summary <coughss> now, otherwise we'll have yeah, to do it all the time. Just, just about summary. timing, Mr. Some, da Mr. Dunning, just before, I'm, I am worried about timing if this is the approach. Um, if you're going to go back to it all again, um, and do it all again. We're now at 11.26, yeah. and I really do think that, in the light of what I said earlier, you really ought to leave at least the afternoon if you're going to have any reply at all to Mr Gibson. So um, I think you've really got to plan on finishing by one o'clock. Understood, understood, my lord. So just quickly summarise the third point, and then I'll move to the fourth point. So the third point is ground two, paragraph seven and eight. Lord Justice Coulson did not address. <coughs> and um, he just failed to address that point. Fourth point, um, ground six. Um, the, and, and, and there are two points under ground six. And the first is the more important of them. Um, well, sorry, let me start again. Ground six contains a number of points. First of all, in paragraph 15, there is the point about the failure to distinguish the position of the different parties. Um, sorry, that's paragraph 16. I'm sorry, I'm getting confused. Let me start again. Can you, can you strike that, please? Um, ground six, Lord Justice Coulson's paragraph 15 does not address the failure to distinguish between the positions of the different parties. Which Hang on, sorry. What? You really have confused me now. I'm you, sorry. You, ground six contains a number of points. Yes. Which is the point? The point which you say is made at 16 is what? That Just give it to me in one sentence. That the argument that, the major, that, that he failed to distinguish between the positions of the different parties and the that the majority of the claimants were not claiming any damages in Brazil, and therefore there were no duplicatory proceedings. And Henderson and, he and therefore, have, Henderson and Henderson had no application on the facts. I'll pick it up from the transcript, yeah. So it's, 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 par it's ground of appeal 16, and his paragraph 15 does not address that point. Well, uh, well we're presumably going to come back to all these later. I, I am, I was yes, just I intended to be the summary. And then, the other arguments under ground six, which are in ground of, grounds of appeal 17 and 18 and 19, were all not addressed. And, I mean, the upshot... The upshot well, sorry, so 16 isn't addressed either? No. no all, yeah. all oh, so none, none of the points are addressed? Exactly. My Lord, the ultimate upshot of this, and if I 
can just summarise it, is that this is not a case where Henderson and Henderson's got anything to do with, except for a possibly a very small minority of claimants who have <coughs> a commenced proceedings in Brazil against a third party and have those proceedings have been concluded. Now that could be argued that they were that was a judgment against the privy, but but, but accepting that. Henderson and Henderson has really got nothing to do with this factual situation we face here. Fifth point, and then um, this is all. This is the last point on the abuse part. That in relation to the striking out of the fifty-eight most valuable claims, which is ground seven, Law Justice Coulson at paragraph sixteen treats this ground as an attack on a finding of fact when it is expressly put as an error of law for taking into account the two factors which the judge took into account in his judgment at paragraphs 136 to 139. Am I Lord... Well, that's the least convoluted of all, Mr. Dunning. Got okay, I'm sorry about this. Um, Good. It is, my lord. Now, I, I I can take two courses now. One, one either to summarise the points on Article Four and and the the jurisdictional points in the same way, or to go straight to look at the points I've made on the abuse part, because the the, the judge also made actual orders under um, under Article um, Thirty Four foreign convenience part and even on the case management part so those are in fact part of his order but it was obviously his alternative they were all his alternative conclusions I mean for my part what I would like to see is is the I would like to put alongside the grounds of appeal that Lord Justice Coulson was looking at or should have been looking at, and the um, judgment or the written reasons he gave, and I would like to have it pointed out to me where the points that you've enunciated, one, two, three, four, five, are not tackled, yeah. not okay. grappled with, or not dealt with, I'll do that now, and where they should be. So and it seems could... to me that's fundamental to this case. If you're right about it, and they're serious points, then you have a chance of getting through this very high barrier. If you are wrong about any of that, then you don't. Yeah. So, my lord, let's, can we go then to the, to the, the two documents I've asked you to have is the grounds and the hand up. Um, well, hang on. Uh, I've got the grounds uh, uh, in the bundle at page electronic page it's 107. Tab six, page 107. A 107. I've got that. And what else do you want? The the document we sent in last week. I mean, the comparison got, got table. Yeah. Yes. Well, maybe, got okay, but surely what we really need is well, Justice Coulson's yes. order, which I've got out loose, because that's the cross comparison we're doing. Well, this, this has an all in it. My well, mind. I don't like being that way, but well, 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 okay. I mean, well, whatever. Yeah, well, I'm sure I can manage. But the only reason is because some, this is helpful, because sometimes he then refers to what Mr. Justice Turner has said. Yes, I'm, I, I may be at cross purposes. Is this a, the, um, as you say, which was submitted recently and um, is 18 pages long? Yeah. Um, but this, I thought the column on the right was. Stuff out of Mr. Justice Turner's yes, I but judgment. But that, right, but that's not the essence of the exercise. No, but 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 some it's, it's helpful because sometimes Lord Justice Coulson refers back to it. That's what that's all. Oh, the I essence see. of the exercise oh, okay. is, is the left hand column. I won't hold things up. Yep. But <coughs> so um, ground one. Um, now, what what has happened in relation to ground one is the you can see the reasons of Lord Justice Coulson, which are set out in the left-hand column. They are in paragraphs 6, 7, and 8 on the hand-up, set out in the hand-up. And what has happened in relation to, to 
ground one it is as follows. Is I'm sorry, ground one is something of an omnium gatherum ground because yeah. most of the key points in it are made again in in subsequent grounds, which is, is a complication the judge had to grapple with. Sorry, my lord, I've lost a, uh, an important document. Well, as I understand this this yep. first point you made, it's. Uh, a failure to deal with paragraph two of ground one, which is, as my lord says, a bit of a, uh, a bit of a, a um, amalgam, but impermissible barriers on access to the court. Yes. And what is said is that the um, irremediably unmanageable approach is wrong as a matter of law. Now. Having got that in mind, we should surely go to the judge's treatment of ground one, which includes paragraph two, and he says it wasn't, the judge's approach was not somehow novel, the judge applied the principles from well-known authorities and didn't create a jurisdictional abuse, uh, and so on and he endorsed paragraphs 20 to 28, and do you say, do you, that he makes no mention of the suggestion that it is um, contrary to law to and, and, and prevents access to justice by bouncing things out on that basis? Yeah. I say that in, that, in, those, in those three paragraphs, six, seven, and eight, yeah. he does the following. First of all, he fails to address the paragraph two of the ground, the impermissible barriers on access to the court. <coughs> well, doesn't he do that later at four? Does well, that well I, agree, I agree that uh, he comes back later at four, and I'll, I'll come back to that in one minute. But I'm trying just to be very systematic. Um, he doesn't deal with it in this context that's here. And he doesn't then deal with it again at under ground four either in our submission. Um, he addresses at paragraph 7 a point which is not being made um, um, and he also in paragraph 8 adopts three points so, sorry, on the point not being made we, we deal with that in paragraph 26a of our skeleton argument and in paragraph 8 he adopts three points which all of which respond to arguments which we were not making um, and so he, the result of this is that he hasn't dealt with what's in paragraph two of ground one, and he doesn't deal with it later under ground four either. And this is about the overriding importance of unhindered access to the court. And the point about Mastercard and Merrick, which, which is cited in the skeleton argument in relation to this round one, paragraph two, and ground four. Well, you said there's nothing in any of this, whether in paragraph six to eight or in relation to ground four, about access to the court or being deprived of access to the court, and there should have been. Right. Can I just ask, structurally, was ground one intended simply as an introduction to the further grounds? Uh, is there any point yes. in ground one which isn't made in, uh, in subsequent grounds? Well, they, the, 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 it was try, it was an attempt to give an overall picture before we went into the detail. Not what they ought to be doing in grounds. But, but my lord, the, oh, yeah. the, 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 there are points made in paragraphs four and five which, which, which summarise the overall effect. I, I, I'm, okay, I'll, I'll, I understand I'll try and you, you know what I feel about this. I I'll keep quiet about it. Um, and um, 
So that's, that's what we say about that. Then paragraph two, sorry, ground two, turning to ground two. Sorry, I thought you were going through your points, not your grounds. I no. thought you were going through the second point, which is ground two at paragraph six and ground one at paragraph one and ground three at paragraphs nine to eleven. What? Is that what you're doing? Which is the novel and contrary to article four point. Yes, yes, I'm going to ground two next, by the way. Well, then, point no, two. are you point going two. to point two? You, you, Mr. Dunning, we must be clear about this. You made five points in answer to my request that you enunciate precisely where the judge failed to deal with substantive issues that were before him in the grounds of appeal. And you said there were five. Yes. The first one was access to justice, and you've shown us, I think so far as you can, that he didn't deal with the access to justice point. The second is that in ground two at paragraph six, and ground one at paragraph one, and ground three at paragraphs nine to eleven, the question of the, the, the judge addressing the wrong question and dealing with it being a novel approach uh, to strike out as an abuse, a company sued in England, etc., etc., and contrary to Article 4 and Lord Gough in Spiliada. Now, now you need to show us yep. that that point has not been dealt with anywhere by the judge. Yep. My Lord, I, if we, uh, I'm, I'm happy to deal with it that way, but in that case, I, sh I should take you back to ground four first, because yes, it's I'll part of ground that. one. Yeah. Paragraph well, two. Yeah, I, I had, I had, I had. I'm sorry. I, I thought we'd just go, we'd go through them one by one, but I, I, I'm happy to group them in the same way, and I, I understand why that's more convenient. So let's look at ground four. What the Lord, what my, this is page seven of the hand up, and ground four is on page A one one one. Yes. Relevant matters. He failed to consider relevant matters, and when one looks at. Um, Ground, what he says about ground four, he says this criticizes the judge's conclusion that the proceedings would be unmanageable. Ground is misconceived. And he says he thinks it was a correct conclusion. And then he makes the point about at a glance, which is not in our any of the materials we put before the... Well, let's article. ignore that. That's, as you say, it's really a, it's not a central point. So it's, it's effectively what he says in paragraph 12, you say he doesn't grapple with the way in which ground four is expressed. Yes. If you look at how ground four is expressed, it is insofar as he held things to be struck out because they were unmanageable. Ground four has two aspects to it. Yeah. One is that it is paragraph 12, which is it's an impermissible barrier to access to the court. Where, where does it say? Yes, I see. Yep. Yeah. And the other is the factual finding, which we challenge in paragraph 13, because of the points which I've been making earlier. So That's what you say, effectively, is he doesn't deal with power 12 at all, which exactly. is that unmanageability shouldn't be the criterion exactly. as a matter of law. Yeah. Instead, he does deal with ground with power 13, which is the factual grounds, and he says it was all open to the judge. Yes, but... But, but he doesn't exactly deal right. with the particular detail points you make under 13 A to F. Yeah, exactly. So the summary is, he doesn't deal with paragraph 12 at all, and he doesn't really grapple with and explain why the points in paragraph 13 would not lead to a different finding, which they obviously would. Now, now I will go to the second point, um, okay. which is ground two at paragraph six, with ground one at paragraph one and ground three. So taking first of all ground two, th this is on page A109. His reasons in relation to this are in paragraph six. Nine. I'm, I'm sorry, no, ground two is nine. Now, he treats this as a, as a complaint 
that the judge wrongly took into account the likelihood of irreconcilable judgments and the, the risk contamination of para parallel proceedings. And he says he, it was rightly taken into account. But the, the, the gist of the point was n not that this was a point that was wrongly taken into account, but that, first of all, it, it's a, if you look at paragraph 7 of the ground, it, it's, a, it, 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 it's a finding that you can't possibly come to in terms of the risk of irreconcilable judgments, as I was, being, as I was explaining earlier. None of these... There just aren't the same parties involved, and there aren't the same issues involved. Well, he does address that by reference to para 31 of the uh, judge's PTA judgment. Yes. So if you look, that's why on the hand up we've got paragraph 31, which that says there could be no justification for drawing a distinction. I prefer to see it in the judgment itself. Which paragraph are you at? We are on Lord Justice Corson's paragraph 9. Yep. Cross refers to paragraph 31 of Mr. Justice Turner's judgment. Yes. Now, the essential point he's making in paragraph 31 is they may not have been meeting the point you were making to us earlier. They may not have brought proceedings yet, square brackets, they're no doubt waiting to see what happens in the 155 billion CPA, uh, but they've all reserved the right to do so yes. once the 155 billion CPA comes in. Now, that, that is a, an attempt to address part of the point you're making. Why isn't it an adequate attempt? Because that's not a just... Not a good basis for striking out the whole proceeding because you can simply require that they undertake that they won't bring proceedings in Brazil. I mean, it, it, it goes to this question of whether the, the draconian remedy of, of striking it out as an abuse is, is justified because if there's ever a judgment in the 155, which may, may never happen, and maybe years and years in the future, in the meantime, they would like to, they've all indicated they want to sue in England. They can be put to their election. But, but the material point is, you say, he failed to address that. Yes. I mean, we... we failed to address that point. We say he failed to address paragraph 6, in, and he failed to address paragraph 7 and 8 um, in his grounds. And, and in particular, at 7 and 8, we explain why we say there was a demonstrable misunderstanding of the evidence which led to the judge's finding that there was there were the claimants that had elected to bring duplication proceedings in both jurisdictions, which is simply unfounded. And the, the true facts are set out in 7 and 8, and Lord Justice Paulson doesn't explain why those points in 7 and 8 would not lead to a different finding. Um, and it simply doesn't address in, and give reasons for rejecting points in paragraphs 7 and 8. Um, in, terms, in terms of ground 3, um, I don't think, well, I don't... Yeah, oh, sorry, the, the point is that 8b, you can hear the whispers, A1, uh, 8b, the point was specifically taken about the option of um, a band, a condition. Yes, for the relevant minority of claimants. So I mean, the fact that they just just to, just to round off that point, the fact that they may have said years ago that they reserved the right to bring to claim in Brazil, they can be put to their election, and that would that would stop them from being, bringing in the future duplicatory proceedings for the, all of the majority who haven't yet brought any proceedings against anyone in Brazil, um, and certainly not against these defendants. Sorry, we're st we're not yet on graph. Oh. We're not yet on ground three. 
Are we? As I understood it, the last question was aimed to, was, was a reference to paragraph 8b of the grounds, which is paragraph part of your point. Of the grounds, part of yes, your sorry. Point no, 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 I, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And so it's, I don't want to read it all out, but there are powerful points made in the lettered subparagraphs in 7 and in 8. I mean, just look at 8A, for example. The, the judge failed to take into account that only a minority of claimants have brought proceedings in Brazil, all of them against parties other than the defendants. Well, isn't then that the just the point that paragraph 31 does make? It doesn't. I mean, it, it, well, that, the point about paragraph 31 is it doesn't meet the point, as it was pointed out, about the um, being put to their election. Yes, but that B, you were saying you yeah. come at A. I'm just saying that they, these are all important points that Mr. Justice Turner didn't take into account. And Lord Justice Coulson doesn't explain in his reasons why the grounds of appeal on 6, 7, and 8 could not have a realistic prospect of success. Yeah, and indeed, um, if one goes to what Lord Justice Coulson said in paragraph 9, um, he, he, he seems to accept the fact findings without appreciating that part of the grounds in 7 and 8 were saying that those fact findings were based on a fundamental misunderstanding of the evidence. And he, so he, he relies on something which without apparently, under, under paragraph 9, appreciating that, that we were saying that those findings were completely unwarranted. Coulson says, the, the judge said expressly at paragraph 104 of his substantive judgment that he would strike out the claims of the abuse without considering these practical burdens. So that, that the, the, really the key point about that is that underlines that Lord Justice Coulson was approaching this on the basis that it was fine to strike out a case on the basis it was unmanageable. And that, that made it all the more important for Lord Justice Coulson to address our first point that it is it's erecting an impermissible barrier to the court to strike out a case as being unmanageable. I mean, ground three, the, the, the judge's paragraph 10 is really a non sequitur, actually. It's, a, it's, it's, um, it, it's completely illogical. I mean, if the complaint were simply that the judge took into account the practical disadvantages of proceeding in England as opposed to Brazil, he plainly did. It's wrong to say it's incorrect, because later he said he would have done, done what he did anyway. Exactly. We were caught in a sort of catch-22 situation where the, 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 Mr. Justice Turner said, this case is unmanageable because of the risk of irreconcilable judgments and cross-contamination. That's really his, his, what he called his central finding. We say that, A, you can't decide that a case is unmanageable, because that's it. And therefore, it's not I mean, What does cross-contamination mean in this context? I know my lord has already asked that. But does he, is he talking about cross-contamination of um, findings on liability, namely the, the finding of whether or not um, there was um, indirect whatever it is, pollution. I don't know. Um, or is he talking about cross-contamination in quantum assessment or causation evaluation? Well, either. It, it must be wrong, because there isn't going to be any quantum assessment in the 155 CPA. Um, that well, I mean, in, in a sense there is, because there's going to be a distribution in theory in 155, is there not? No. There's going to be some payment. No. 
No? No, it only no. determines liability. Right, OK. Um, Remind me why it's called the 155 billion EPA. That was the size of the claim or something? Yes, but if it's only about liability, you, it doesn't need a number. Mm. I, I Oh, I think it just may have been a rough already. Yes, but I mean, just answer this. I mean, I, I, how do they get the money in under the C, under a CPA? They have to bring their own proceedings. What I understood you to be telling me is that a, a CPA is a purely liability vehicle. Right. Well, not even a liability vehicle. It's a breach vehicle, if using English language. It decides that they have broken their duties. And then people who say, I've suffered by your loss of your duties, have to bring separate proceedings and then can rely on the finding made at that collective level. Have I got that right? That's my understanding. And with one further glitch, which is that it could, if it goes against the claimants, it's not binding on the claimants, but it's binding on the wrongdoer. Yeah, all, yeah. That, all that's yeah. understandable. That, but it's not, a, it's not a proceeding that goes into causation and loss. No, right. It's still a bit of a puzzle then why it refers to any numbers at all, but let's not well, worry about that now. But maybe I can invite one of my, my juniors to, to, to deal with that because I don't know the reason why for that. But, but also, just, just to highlight, CPA means civil public action. The point about a civil public action is it can only be brought by someone who is at a public official like You have made that point already. It's um, not brought by any of the parties, it is brought by the federal prosecutor, as it were, in the public interest, to facilitate the bringing of claims if it's successful. Yeah. The, the only exception to that is the, the 25 municipalities could arguably bring their own CPAs because they are public institutions. Well, we are told there are actually other CPAs out there. Yes, there are. Yeah. But, but brought by state prosecutors. Yeah. That's there an is unnecessary complication. No, no, I agree, I agree, but I just wanted to be clear. It, it's a public law action, essentially. Yeah. Now, um, <clears throat> so that's, now let's move on then to, so I think that's dealt with, with um, my second group of points, that, um, Which is, which you've dealt with, and I dealt with the um, the third group of points under ground two, at paragraphs um, seven and eight in particular. And now let's move to the fourth group of points, which is ground six. Well, hang on. Where does the judge deal with your with your ground two? Yeah, you, ground two. You seem to sort of pass over ground two, which I understood was about Article four in the Spiliada. Um, and you seem to have sort of passed over that and gone into the factual things, which was your ground three. But um, sorry, ground ground two. Yes, your but your point three, which you were coming to, I wrote down is ground two, paragraph seven and eight. That's correct, but he's dealt with that. Yeah, I, I, I so, think what so my then don't we need to go to ground four? Well, point, point I, four, you mean? except he hasn't dealt with point two. But yeah. well, power, point two. Is the it's the it's the point about asking the wrong question in light of Article That's um, right. Four and of the of the Brussels recast and Spiliada, and the, the short point is that paragraph six of the reasons does not address that and explain why it's it's wrong. I mean, it, it talks about it, the saying that the judge's approach is somehow novel and not in accordance with the law. And it just says, that's wrong. Well-known authorities didn't create a category of jurisdictional abuse. I mean, the well-known authorities he's referring to is presumably A.B. and Wyeth. Yes. Because that's the only well-known authority that comes close. Is that right? Yes, it is. That's the only case. And it's a pre-CPR case and a pre-group group action case um, where... Um, where it was held that it was pointless and wasteful yes. to bring a large set of proceedings in, in England in relation to a, a drug where 
there was very little evidence of, of damages. And um, that was a case... Did, it, did it deal with staying proceedings against English, against defendants properly served within the jurisdiction? No. And Article 4? No, it wasn't a jurisdictional type of dispute at all. No. It, well, that's, that's the point. Well, yeah. I understood Lord Justice Coulson to be saying in paragraph 6 was, really all this point about jurisdiction is beside the point. But the judge's real point is that these were pointless and wasteful, to which your answer, as I understand it, is the reason they are pointless and wasteful, if they are, is because there are separate proceedings in a foreign jurisdiction. Yes. So it's not really an, his answer is not an answer. That's, that's one answer. Yeah. The other, there are two other answers, at least. One is that the judge didn't actually make a finding it was pointless and wasteful. Um, he set out the case but he didn't make a finding that it was pointless and wasteful. That's, that's um, another point. But, but thirdly, how could it be pointless and wasteful here to bring proceedings for millions of dollars against uh, defendants who, who are not party to any Brazilian proceedings? And none of the, none of the, Brazilian, none of the Brazilian proceedings is going to create an issue estoppel against these defendants. I mean, no, it might be, you might, it, it would be a very strange case in my submission to say, you should go and sue other parties who you may get a lot less money from in Brazil, but you can't choose, as you wish to do, to sue the two parent companies in their place of domicile and registered office, where they are good for the money and the claims are, mil are billions. Now that can't, that, on any view, that couldn't be pointless and wasteful. That's a perfectly sensible and rational thing to do. To bring, when, particularly when the proceedings, the main CPA in Brazil is stymied in a, in a four year continuing stay. Um, so, so my lord, there are, there are a number of reasons why the, the strikeout couldn't be justified on the basis of pointless and wasteful. Well, well you say it's a, it's a classic case, really, where the judge didn't grapple with the substance. I mean, I, I have some sympathy with the judge, I have to tell you, um, in not grappling with it, because it's the way it's put in your grounds is so diffuse. My Lord, I, I'm not saying I don't have sympathy for him either. I mean, I'm just saying that the result is that a, a hugely important case has not which ought to be a case, in my respectful submission, clearly ought to be a case for permission to appeal, has not been um, dealt with in the way that it, that it should have done, because it should have resulted in, a, in permission to appeal if all the grounds had been specifically addressed. And the, 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 I, I do rely on the fact that, only in a su supporting way, that he seemed to think, for example, he could dismiss certain points which we were not running. Um, there, there, there are six points at which we've explained in our skeleton argument, which he attacks us for, and saying it's unreasonable to make this point and so forth. But it's not a point that appeared anywhere in the papers that were presented to the Court no, of Appeal. But if you're not right about your substantive five points, then that's just noise, really. No, but if, I'm, if I am right, that adds to the exceptional nature. If you are right, you don't need it. So. Well, I would say it adds to the exceptional nature of the case. That, 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 that but I, but I, I'm, so I'm, I'm not giving up reliance on those points, but I do, I'm not, that's certainly not the centerpiece of my argument. The centerpiece of my argument is he failed to grapple with really important points and, and hasn't um, and Okay, Lord, well, we're, we've now uh, arrived at your fourth point, yes. which is that point ground six. Yes. Now, this is, this is really... Um, This is really the, the, um, the, the next important point. Um, the, the, and, 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 uh, there are, as I said when I was summarizing it, four separate paragraphs made under this ground. And <coughs>
he hasn't um, grappled with and dealt with this. Um, he's, he hasn't dealt with really paragraphs 17, 18, and 19 at all. And the, what he says is that this is a criticism that the, the judge wrongly took into account the claimant's tactical decision to progress closely related damages claims simultaneously in Brazil and England. Well, that, it's hardly to be blamed for saying that, because that's exactly what round six says. I'm um, reading round six. Yes, but... The judge, in particular, as he struck out proceedings on the grounds that a claimant had taken a tactical decision to progress close, closely uh, related damages in the English, British and Indian, British, sorry, and Brazilian... Brazil and English jurisdiction simultaneously. So he was simply quoting from your ground. Yes, but it goes on to say, proceeded on a demonstrable misunderstanding of the evidence, took into account irrelevant matters, and failed to take into account... So this is another example of a ground which isn't really a ground, but is a sort of heading for some grounds that come later. Anyway. Well, I think that's a, that is a fair point, my lord. I don't disagree with that. But, um, um, my lord, but when he... So he says it's a a criticism of a tactical decision to progress closely related damages claims in Brazil and England. But anyone who really had studied these grounds would know that, that we, we were fundamentally disputing the proposition that the claimants had brought simultaneous claims in Brazil and England, because the majority of them had not brought any claim in Brazil. Well, it all turns on 126 and 127 of the judgment. Yes, but that doesn't take it very far, because um, as one can see, um, well, that, actually one needs then to go to the main, to the main judgment. In relation to that. Well, the judge says, by the end of 2019, no fewer than 27,000 claims had been adjudicated upon in 414 days, and just under half the people had already accepted a payment. From Renova. Yes. So that's so that. But my, my Renova. Well, so let's deal with the two parts of that. First of all, the case is adjudicated upon. That is around about ten percent. It's not by any means the majority. And if if that if 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 if, if that is correct, then those then there, there will be case management ways of dealing with that group, that subgroup less than 10% or around about 10% as a separate category. It is no justification for striking out the proceedings of all of the majority who have brought no proceedings in Brazil at all. I thought your complaint about 126 was that it was generic. What it failed to do was drill down to, to um, the facts of this case and the position of the individual claimants here. Yes, we have. I mean, that, that, is, that, is, that, is, that is also so, correct. So, that, so that's despite, all well and good, you say, but, but what, what you would say the Lord Justice failed to, to grapple with is, is the, the specific points on the specific facts here. Yes, I do, but just taking it at its highest, it's even, it doesn't even, even then it's only a very small mi minority, but it's not, a, it's not correct because it doesn't actually apply. The other point, my Lord, about Renova that you put to me, the point that Renova is not a judicial compensation scheme at all. It's, the, it's a voluntary extrajudicial compensation scheme which pays you something like £150 in, in, the current, in our currency equivalent. Or things like you didn't have water for a number of days. It doesn't cover all the heads of loss that these claimants want to claim in relation to. It's, I mean, it's almost like saying if you have a car accident and then you, you're, you're your aunt sends you a letter saying, you know, here's a cheque for £1,000, I hope this pays for the repairs. That means you can't claim for the person who caused the car accident. It, we would say in English terminology, in Latin, res inter alias actor. But it, it's not a judicial proceeding in any event, the Renova. And this is another fundamental point that we made in our grounds, and which, which um, one doesn't find reflected in Justice Turner's judgment, and it's overlooked by um, Lord Justice Coulson. Indeed, but where is that in your grounds? I don't see it. Under grounds. Is it para 18? Thank you. Sorry, my fault. The nearest. I think it's the one we have here. 
See, the exercise we've got to do is we've got to look. It's what we keep not actually doing. It's looking at actually what was pleaded. Yes. And seeing how the judge dealt with it. We haven't. You haven't taken us through 16 to 19 at well, all. Well, no, uh, I haven't. But my lord, the, the fact, the point is that he didn't deal with. Um, he, he took well, the show us, show, show us what 16 to 19 are, and then show us that he didn't deal with them. Well, I'm, I was showing you what he said in paragraph 15, which is the only paragraph. Where 15? Did you mean? Lord yeah. Justice Corson's 15 on page 9 of the handbook. Mm -hmm. Where it says, this is a criticism the judge wrongly took into account the claimant's tactical decision. And then the reference to 126, we went to the reference to 126 of the judgment. And then he says, furthermore, to the extent the judge criticised for taking into account the principles in Henderson and Henderson, I reject that criticism. Well, I mean, he doesn't. He just doesn't explain how Henderson Henson can have any application. Well, I mean, your big point is surely in the last words. That is plainly a relevant consideration when considering striking out duplicatory proceedings. You say they're not. Not here, my lord, because there weren't any duplicatory proceedings. Well, that's well, the point I'm just making. To yes. You. Yes, I mean, sorry. You, you, you say, that it's a point to help you, um, yep. I mean, you say that, that he misunderstood what he was dealing with. Yes. Um, and that, I think, is your uh, fourth point, that Henderson and Henderson really had nothing to do with it, because yes. these were proceedings that had never previously been brought anywhere by most people. I mean, there had been a few of them, but the way of dealing with that is to knock the few out, or... To to elect. Case management. Yes, exactly. yeah. That's exactly my point, my lord. And I'm okay. sorry if I'm making it more elaborate than it well, needs I think to be. You are a bit, yes. Okay. But, but so so he, he basically hasn't dealt with 16, 17, uh, 18, and 19. And so far as he's touched on 16, he hasn't really given, hasn't really addressed it and given reasons why it's wrong. Um, and he doesn't seem to have appreciated that the whole the whole finding of duplicatory proceedings was being criticised as being contrary to the, effectively facts which were common ground. And then your fifth point is that he doesn't deal at all with the 58 who haven't got a claim at all and are being struck out along with the rest. Well, my, it's, it's slightly different, my lord, that um, if we look at ground seven, yeah. um, it's on A115. Yeah. At paragraph 20, we say the judge erred in law in holding that these 58 claims fell, fell to be struck out because they would still give rise to the acute risk of irreconcilable judgment, and in a broader sense, conflicting developments in the parallel jurisdictions. Now, the, it was common ground that these 58, uh, along with everyone else, are not bringing any proceedings against the defendants, but these these, these, in addition to that, these 58 are not covered by the CPA anyway. So even if he was right in relying on the CPA, that these 58 are, it was common ground are outside the CPA, and they are outside of Renova. So they can't even, they, they can't even get the 150 pounds for the fact that they didn't have any water for the next days. Um, they, these are some of the largest claimants with the biggest claim. Yeah. And he gave two reasons, um, but both of which we say, uh, we set this out in paragraph 21, and both of which we say are not reasons in law for striking out their claims as an abuse of the jurisdiction. And, and one is that it was just a finding of fact, and the second is that... Um, Conflicting developments in parallel jurisdictions would render the proceedings completely unmanageable. Yeah. And what? You know, this is this is paragraph. So it's at the top of one one six, my lord. When we set out that the. Sorry, I'm saying what the judge said. Yes. And he and he just doesn't deal with the actual points that we've made in these grounds. Well, he does. You mean if you look at take twenty one b. Which is the, the 58 claims will be claims will be able to bring their claims to the courts of Brazil outside the scope of the CPAs, right? Yeah. And the judge says, 
in the last uh, Coulson LJ said, so that's what we're dealing with, at the end of paragraph 16, all the 58 claimants referred to have made or are entitled to make claims of one sort or another in Brazil. The fact that those claims may fall outside the special compensation scheme is nothing for the point. Now, you may say that's a bad answer, but remember, this is a reopening point. Your point should be he doesn't grapple with it. Yeah, he does grapple with it. It seems to me... Um, yeah, but, but he doesn't grapple with the point that we're making, which is that this was... An, the, the judge didn't give that as a reason for his decision. The judge gave us a reason for his decision. The two points which you set out in A and B in 21. And we say, in law, neither of the t judge's two points could constitute... Um, a reason for striking out the proceedings of the 58 as an abuse. So the reason that it's given by Lord Justice Corson is not the reason which was given by the judge on this point. Well, that sometimes happens. Well, but we, we, can, we can only attack the judge's decisions. Um, I mean, the judge gave his, these two reasons, which we've set out in A and B, Anyway, we can compare ground seven with the way he deals with it. So, my lord, that is; those are the reasons why we say that the abuse um, grounds were not addressed and grappled with, and were not adequate reasons given in relation to them. Now, my lord, we then come to the um, the jurisdictional which were the alternative um, findings. And can I give you a summary first before, before we go through the, the, the detail? I think that would be in the same way that I did on well, the... Well, doesn't that just mean we'll do it all twice? Sorry, it's my lord to say that I just worried. How many points have you got this time on the jurisdiction aspect? Of where he well, completely failed to grapple with the point you've made? Let me just count them, my lord. Um, well, I think, really, I mean, really... Um, We've got one, two, sorry, that's, we, I think it's virtually every ground I mean, we, 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 we make that point in relation to. So I think rather than trying to summarize, it might be best just to go through. Just go through them. Yeah. So um, first of all, ground um, eight, First of all, Lord Justice Corson says it would be academic because, because the claims would be struck out in any event. But, but of course, we're only addressing it on the basis that we get permission to appeal on the abuse aspects. So then we're trying to show that this is wrong. So the only reason he gives in relation to ground eight is in paragraph 18 of his reasons. And what has happened is that. Um, he has not dealt with the points made in paragraphs 23 and 24. He's only addressed the initial point in paragraph 22 about whether the House of Lords decision on Article 30 in Sario can be read across to Article 34. My Lord. Before we go any further, is, do I need to just remind the court what the terms of Article 4 and 24 are? Or, or, no. Um, what about the recitals? Because the recitals are also afraid uh, mm, yeah. I, I personally need to be reminded of the recitals. Me too. No, all right. Well, I'll move on. Um, but the, the, essentially, what Article 34 <coughs> is about is, is, is a very limited exception to the, the, to the domicile rule. In Article Four of the regulation, yes, whereby, and it was only introduced, um, I think, in 2012. It wasn't in earlier versions of the regulation or in the conventions. And 
what the, and, and it only applies as against proceedings in a third state. So Article 34 says, if there are proceedings falling within Article 34 in a third state, in other words, a state outside the EU, then you can stay the proceedings against the, in, e, the EU, now UK, domiciled party who you've sued as of right in his place of domicile if these limited conditions are satisfied. And the conditions that have to be satisfied are that there, there can be, within a reasonable time, an incoming judgment from the third state which will be, uh, there's a risk that that judgment will be irreconcilable with the proceedings in England that that judgment will be capable of recognition and it will arrive here within a reasonable time. And all of those points were in our grounds and have not been adequately um, addressed. Now, we did... Sorry, are we on ground eight? Or are you slipping into other grounds? I'm I've... trying to just encapsulate the whole thing before I go to it, but I will now go to ground eight, my lord. So, Ground 8, in paragraph 22, simply asks um, the, um, the, the question of whether the risk of irreconcilable judgments is to be interpreted in line with the decision of the, of the House of Lords in relation to Article 30, which was a decision before Article 34 existed and is concerned with intra-EU litigation, not litigation as between the EU... You don't need this degree of detail. Though. Isn't your point that he deals with Paragraph 22 by saying it doesn't matter? And your point is that Paragraphs 23 and 24 explain why it does matter, uh, and particularly Paragraph 24, yes. uh, and he doesn't deal with that. So it would be a complete answer uh, if it really didn't matter. Um, and that's, that's what you need to say about Ground Eight, isn't it? Well, that, that's exactly right. Um, we, we, we say that he simply... And the judge doesn't... didn't say, or Justice Coulson didn't say there isn't an arguable point about whether we follow Sario or whether we follow yeah. the two first instance decisions. Yeah. He said it doesn't matter to the result. Exactly. And your point is he doesn't deal with your further grounds which say why it does matter to the yeah. result. And he, well, so isn't he, that what you need to say? Yes, that he has failed to appreciate that it does matter to yeah. the result if we are right about the points in 23 and 24, which he hasn't addressed. Right. That's exactly it. Um, now, then we have come to ground nine. Um, and, and what has happened in relation to ground nine is that there are um, two, well, there, there are two paragraphs under ground nine. And Lord Justice Coulson has dealt with um, the question of whether it's expedient to hear and determine the related actions together, and says it appears to set up as inconsistent court appeal authorities. Um, now that is a reference to the points made in paragraph 26, the Kolomoisky case and Euro Echo Fields case. But what Lord Justice Coulson hasn't done in relation to Ground 9 is address the points in paragraph 25. Now he simply hasn't addressed that pr the primary point under this ground in paragraph 25 at all. Um, and he's only addressed the subsidiary point in paragraph 26. Now, then ground 10, he, which is on page A118, we say that the judge failed to address the question whether it was um, expected that the court of a third state would give a judgment capable of recognition. 
and there are two points under that. One is the expected point, and the other is the capable of recognition point. So there are two elements of, a, of an expected judgment which is capable of recognition. And what, is, um, what has happened is that he has adopted Mr. Justice Turner's point, but Mr. Justice Turner's point um, doesn't address the capable of recognition point. It only addresses the expected point. So as a result, he's not addressed the point in paragraph 28 that any judgment from the CPA, 155BN CPA, would not be capable of recognition in England for all the reasons that I've been explaining about the lack of similar issues and lack of similar parties, or the same parties even. So and he simply hasn't, um, hasn't addressed that. And it, this is all part of him not appreciating that the proceedings in Brazil are not duplicatory proceedings. They are, <coughs> don't involve the same parties, either the defendants or the claimants, and they're not going to resolve the issues that are the issues that have to be resolved in order to establish the liability of the defendants as indirect polluters in, in this action. Um, and then um, ground 11 goes to the necessary for the proper administration of justice. And here we had five paragraphs, 29, 30, 31, 32, and 33. Um, and they take five different but related points and if one looks at what Lord Justice Coulson says about ground 11 um, he basically says um, it's misconceived the judge took into account the connections between the facts of the case parties in the third state and reaches its conclusion precisely what he's obliged to do came to the right conclusion, I agree with and endorse the second judgment. And that really does not address each of the five points in paragraphs 29, 30, 31, 32, and 33. It is a conclusory, conclusory expression of opinion without giving reasons why the points can't succeed or have a pro reasonable prospect of succeeding. Um, and in particular, look at, I mean, if I may ask you to, um, look at paragraph 30, the, 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 the judge of the grounds. The judge failed to take into account, because there was no other overlap between the parties to the 155 BNCPA and the parties in these proceedings, there was no possibility that any decision in the 155 the NCPA would create an issue of stop and hence bind any of the parties to these proceedings. Any future judgment in the CPA would neither obviate the need for trial of the present action, nor even narrow the scope of the issues in the action. And, 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 and then it, we, there are detailed points in the subsequent paragraphs, 31, 32, and 33, none of which have been addressed by Lord Justice Coulson. Um, and a, as an irreducible minimum, um, the learned judge would, the, sorry, Lord Justice Coulson would have had to explain why he thought there was an overlap and deal with the argument that there was no overlap. Um, um, and, ha, and, and he would have had to make a finding, we say, of when when he thought that a, that a judgment would emerge from Brazil in coming to England which would decide anything useful for the purpose of the English proceedings. And um, on the common ground evidence, that couldn't be in anything less than seven or eight years. So how could it be a sensible course in the, in the interests of justice 
to stay the English proceedings pending a judgment that may never arrive, but if it does arrive, won't arrive for seven or eight years, and won't decide anything as between the parties to this action. And that, those were our fundamental points, that it, there was um, no utility uh, in a stay at all, and it would just cause huge and unwarranted delay. Um, so that um, is ground 11. Um, I mean, ground, ground, ground 12 is really just, um, as Lord Justice Corson says, is, is, is just, in a sense, repeats the previous grounds. And we, we simply say that having not dealt with the previous five paragraphs, um, Lord Justice Corson didn't deal with them again when they were relied on for the purposes of paragraph 34 in ground 12. Um, and he doesn't, he doesn't explain why, if we, if we pick up the last sentence of paragraph 34, please, no reasonable tribunal properly instructed as to the law could exercise its discretion within the context of Article 34 to stay the English proceedings for a lengthy and uncertain period of time to await proceedings between third parties which would have no material impact on the English proceedings. And Lord Justice Corson just doesn't seem to either understand or meet that point. The forum convenience um, grounds are then dealt with in, in grounds 13 and 14. And roughly speaking, ground 13 relates to the first stage in Spiliada, and ground 14 relates to the second stage in Spiliada. And we say that the, um, the judge's decision is rightly to be criticised at both stages. And so far as stage one in Spiliada is concerned, what the learned judge doesn't properly take into account, and what Lord Justice Corson doesn't seem to have appreciated, if he did agree so, it doesn't give proper effect to, is that we, we are only approaching the forum convenience against the Australian company on the hypothesis that the claimants have been successful up to this point. In other words, they've defeated the abuse argument, and they've defeated the stay argument, and there is jurisdiction as of right against the first defendant under Article 4 because it's domiciled. So what is then going to be happening is that there is going to be an action in England against one of the two joint parent companies who operate with a joint management committee. And all of the same matters that are relied upon against the first defendant are relied against the other, the Australian defendant. Their, dis their knowledge and their conduct is the same. Maybe minor differences, but essentially the case pleaded against them is, is that they are jointly and severally liable for the same matters as a matter of strict liability under Brazilian law as an indirect polluter. And so in those circumstances, if we have established jurisdiction against the English company and we're relying on all the things that were the joint knowledge of the two through the joint management committee and the joint executives who run this group, how could it possibly make sense to have a separate trial against the Australian company in Brazil? Um, and the, um, we, we say that, that in those circumstances, the natural forum for the case against the second part of the joint parent, the Australian part, is also in England, where the first part, the, dom the English domicile company, is going to be sued. Is, is it right the judge did find, did he, Mr. Justice Turner, that um, he, it wasn't on the, it, his decision on form non convenience wasn't on the basis that um, the English company wouldn't be sued here? It was on the premise, was it, that even if the action against the English company continued, uh, for, that form non convenience would apply in favour of the Australian company? Yes, it was. So, as to be litigated, sued in, in Brazil. That, that's what Mr. Justice Turner decided, yes. So, um, I mean, and then these, are, these, are, these are joint parent companies with a joint management board. They are effectively an economic unit, but they're listed in two different places as, as public companies. So, um, it doesn't make sense, we say, 
when they are jointly and severally, severally liable for the same knowledge and the same act of conduct for them to be sued um, in two different places. If one's established jurisdiction as of right against the English company, then applying properly the first stage in Spiliaga, the natural forum to, to sue the other half of the parent is in England as well. It's and completely the, my fault I've missed this, so the, just give me the paragraph in Mr Justice Turner's judgment, please. I'll, I'll, I'll get that if I Don't worry, I'll find it. Um, and on the, in that regard, we, we, um, we relied upon the approach of Mr Justice Stuart Smith in, in the very similar situation in the Jalla case. Now, the Jalla case concerned proceedings against Shell um, and in relation to environmental pollution caused by Shell in Nigeria. And what... What happened is that was in that case there was an, there was one English company, not the parent company, but the um, English trading company, and also a Nigerian company. And the learned judge rightly held that as soon as one has established jurisdiction as against the English company, then it made perfect sense for the in that case the Nigerian company to be party to the same trial. And um, this is in tab um, 7 um, of the um, authorities bundle. And, <coughs> and it's, um, it, it's the bottom right hand numbering is page 457, page, which is 200, page 271 of the law report. So having decided and in um, that the English company must be sued in England and there would not be a stay because, for example, the Nigerian Attorney General had brought environmental proceedings against shell companies in Nigeria. And he dealt with that at paragraphs 245 through to 246. It, it, and he held there if I could ask you first of all to look on page 456 he's under the fourth point about six lines down he says although the factual connections in Nigeria is almost complete the English court's jurisdiction is not to be asked on forum convenience grounds and that being so there's no reason to assume that imposing a stay until after the Nigerian courts have reached their conclusions will either cause the English proceedings to be abandoned to determine the outcome of the English proceedings or eliminate the risk of irreconcilable findings altogether. So he excluded the sort of factors that Mr Justice Turner took into account here, namely the foreign convenience factors, in exercising the discretion under Article 34. Having done that, he then turned to the Nigerian company and if I could direct your attention to paragraph 249, he says, I conclude that it's reasonable for the English court to try the case against Stasco for two reasons. First, the jurisdiction is founded on Article 4, and the main arguments that might be raised against trying the case in England are essentially forum convenience arguments that are inadmissible. Second, it's not obvious that any of the Nigerian cases will proceed to an examination of Stasco's role or legal responsibility for the spill. That leaves the question of where England is the proper place to bring the claim against Snepco. And he says, um, he says that because there's going to have to be an inquiry of the load into the loading operations, it's plainly sensible the claims against both to proceed in the same jurisdiction. Now that, that sort of analysis that we've set out there is the sort of analysis that Mr Justice Turner was, was asked to apply. This case was cited to him, but he did not apply. And we, we say that you can't, first of all, you can't take forum non-convenience factors into account when you're exercising the discretion under Article 34. You have to... You, Article 34 focuses on the incoming judgment and whether it will arrive in a reasonable period of time when it's expected 
what it will decide, and whether it will be capable of recognition. Having done that, you then turn to the other defendant. Here, it's, it's a stronger case because the other defendant is an Australian company which was actually served in England because it has a registered office there. But it follows necessarily, we say, that um, as soon as one has a, an inquiry into the liability of one, that same inquiry should happen in relation to the uh, liability of the other. And it's a fortiori here because they are joint parent companies and the same knowledge and conduct is relied upon against both. Well, you've made that point. And, and you say that was simply not dealt with in paragraphs 23 to 25 of the Lord Justice's reasons. Yes. I mean, we, we say that so far as ground 13 is concerned, Lord Justice Coulson has... Um, Is, is wrong because the um, he says the judge took into account the points listed in paragraph 35 um, in, of, the, of our grounds but when one actually looks to Mr. Justice Turner's reasons at paragraph 241 uh, he doesn't make any reference to those four points so that you're just, slipping into a risk of simply saying that the, or Justice Coulson got it wrong that, I'm afraid, sometimes happens, but that's not um, ground for reopening. Isn't this a, is this a good example of him failing to grapple? Well, he has, he's not grappled with the points because he seems to think the points have been dealt with in the judgment when they haven't. Well, I suppose the more general criticism you make is that he simply... Um, always says um, in answer to every point uh, this is wrong for the reasons given by the judge at such and such a place without actually grappling with the complaint that the judge had been wrong at that place yes um, which is not a particularly good approach you probably would say for um, dealing with an appeal an application for permission to appeal because obviously one is looking at it, it it's I mean you can sometimes in dealing with a permission to appeal application say the judge was right for the reasons he gave but you you have to be careful not to say that when there is a challenge uh, that for example as as you hear I think in your major points do contend that the judge had failed to address the major points put to him. So he can't be right for the reasons he's gave in relation to those points. Exactly. Or, or and the classic, I mean, the, the classic points, which I personally think um, one might be wise to focus on, are your, your first point, um, which is that um, the judge, the, the Coulson LJ, uh, did not address the challenge to the judge's judgment about impermissible barriers to access to the court, which the judge, Turner J, didn't deal with, and neither did Coulson LJ, uh, properly, you say. And uh, the second ground, which is that he didn't really ever deal with the question that these were defendants properly sued within the jurisdiction and uh, that gave them a prima facie right for the proceedings to continue unless there was some very strong ground why not see the Spiliada in Article 4 and Article 34 had to be dealt with but uh, he didn't really tackle those grounds either and um, Well my lord I would add to that that, that he uh, adopted Mr Justice Turner's finding that these were the decision to bring, a tactical decision to bring duplicatory proceedings without appreciating that Well that he did appreciate, I mean I think it's wrong to say he didn't appreciate that they were not, the CPA was not the same, I mean he describes the CPA as, as I understand it fairly accurately in the early paragraphs Turner I mean 
in the early paragraphs. He describes what it is and, and how it works. But it's then assumed that the process in Brazil is duplicatory of the process here without any proper analysis, as you say, of the defendants and the fact that they're properly sued here, that they're not sued in Brazil, uh, and, and so on and so on, and the delays in Brazil and so on. But, I mean, your, your point is that the judge doesn't really tackle the attacks on the judge's judgment. His basic response is the judge was right in every particular without dealing with the points you make. Yes. I mean, I think that's your point. I mean, it is a rather, unfortunately, it's, com it's convoluted because your grounds of appeal are, are terribly convoluted. You know, as my Lord has said, and I, I suspect we shall be saying in our judgments, it is absolutely imperative in setting out grounds of appeal that you do thinking before you do writing. And what one takes from these documents is that all the writing was done first and the thinking was done later and you need to think what is my attack my fundamental attack on this judgment the way I normally put it Mr Dunning is that to get permission to appeal you have to get a screwdriver into the judge's judgment yes. and you need to identify the screwdriver the hole into which you're putting your screwdriver first and all that's been done much later oh, what I would say The judgment is a very difficult one to, to attack because of the because of the sort of multi-layered way that it has been structured. Um, it, it is it is that many of our grounds start with insofar as the judge decided such and such because it, it wasn't entirely clear that whether the judge decided that or not. Um, so the grounds were difficult. Well, the judge took a very strong view, didn't he? Very, um, very strong view, my lord. I mean, right from that. I, I wasn't there, but I understand <laughs> that, that throughout the entire hearing. Well, it shines through his judgment that he took a strong view. Um, and you say, do you, that... Um, well, I'd be repeating myself. I mean, what you say is that the, 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 the appeal judge um, simply endorsed the strong view. And he called it a paradigm case for a strikeout of an abuse, as an abuse. And that's his phrase that he used in paragraph four, for example, of his rulings. And we say that it's, it's not a paradigm case when you properly understand what was common ground. And one, one just analyzes our, our points as we put them forward. It's not a paradigm case at all. The central finding of manageability is one that can be dealt with by less draconian means striking out the entire proceedings of everybody. Well, it's not really a paradigm case in the sense that there's only ever been one case that anybody's been able to find where a uh, case has been struck out on our manageability grounds, and that was really a completely different yeah. case. Well, my lord, perhaps that's a good more point to move to the what I wanted to say on permission to appeal, because which overlaps with strong probability that it was, which was, which was wrong. Because, because I want to do, I do want to say something about manageability, uh, as um, outside of Lord Justice Corson's reasons, for example, as to why, why that cannot be a good ground for striking out. Well, do you need to say any more, having been told that our provisional view at the moment is that permission to appeal ought to have been granted? I'll, I'll reserve it for, for reply. So you really need to respond, don't you, to Mr. Gibson's? Yeah. No doubt, to a pause on that subject. But, but, but is it? Is it um, are you trying to press the button on the strength of your case? Which, if you're right on your analysis of your authorities, it may be a relevant consideration. Was that where you were driving, Mr. Dunning? Yes. I mean, I, uh, on my fifth proposition that I started with this morning, I, I said I accept that I have to show there's a strong probability that the result would have been different if the process. Of yes, but the result is permission to appeal. Exactly. Well, you, 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 you have provisionally, and I emphasize provisionally, persuaded us that there's not only a strong possibility, but we would have granted permission. Yes. So uh, that would seem to be satisfied if you've got through the original gateways. But I mean, if you want to make any I, points, I think I only want to make you, please well, do. I, 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 Was there any particular point on management? I, I do want to make one particular point, which is that my respectful. 
the, the court actually has a duty to manage cases that are, that are properly before the court. Um, one finds that duty in CPR 1.1, 1.4. Um, and what, then there is a special procedure, obviously, for group actions, which is CPR 19. And CPR 19 starts by saying that CPR 19 can be used no matter how many claimants. So it's clearly intended to be used for vast numbers of claimants, maybe hundreds of thousands, maybe millions, like in the Google case. Well, it would be a strong judge that said too many claimants means you can't bring the claim. No, but, but so, so what, what, in, in, what happens is that normally in a group action, like the Volkswagen case or the Colombian Farmers case, there is active case management, identify a preliminary issue, and then have lead cases. Now, in this particular instance, and again, the court may not have fully appreciated this yet, it was common ground that if the matter proceeded, there would be a preliminary issue of the liability of the two companies. But just indirect pollution or fault-based liability as I well? Think it, I think just indirect just, pollution. Right, so just the strict liability. No, all of it. Oh, all of it. Right. All, all, all of it. But in any event, it, 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 was, it, was, it was turning on their liability and in the light of the conduct of the British... Well, that's not the, surprising, is it? You look at the facts. No, no, and it's exactly yes. what the, the, the Mr. Justice Waxman has done in the, in the emissions cases, for example. So, but at that, the, the point is that at that stage, there would be no risk of cross contamination of judgments at all, because there are no cases trying the liability of these defendants in Brazil. Mm -hmm. So, the liability of these defendants. Is going to be complete that preliminary issue, which it was common ground, would be the first step in these proceedings, would be untrammeled, not affected by cross contamination, I think not we've affected got that by point. any risk of irreconcilable judgments. Mr. Mercer's got a point he wants yeah. to make. Um, yeah. Uh, now, then, of course, if it's said, well, these claimants have accepted £150 from Renova for their fact their tap wasn't working um, and, then, uh, and either they can't claim that head again or they can't claim at all or these claimants, th this, this subset of claimants have brought proceedings in Brazil and they ought not to be allowed to discontinue them. What, all those sort of points are scooped up in, in lead cases in, in a group litigation. They, I mean they, the judge, Mr Justice Turner, um, you know said case management is not a magic wand. He referred to the fact that you hadn't, as it were, provided a route map through to judgment, to which your response was, we haven't even had a defence yet. Yes. Um, but, but you had got as far, actually. Uh, did Mr Justice Turner know that there had been this agreement as to a preliminary issue on liability? Yeah. You probably don't. common ground in the skeleton argument, I see. I'm told. I see. Now, Now, just for example, just I, mean, I make that point, and my Lord, the Master of Roles says, well, you've, you've made the point, but, but, just, but in, if you go back to Lord Justice Coulson's paragraph 9, he assumes that the finding about cross-contamination is correct. But it's got, it, it has no impact at all on that first liability stage of the proceedings at all. And insofar as there would be any cross-contamination and risk of irreconcilable judgments, that can all be case managed by, for example, making elections or having trial cases. I mean, for example, is the Renova scheme the equivalent of a check from my aunt? Or, in, in other words, it's res inter alios actor, or is it um, legal compensation? And if so, does it disqualify you entirely? that you've taken £150 from the Renova voluntary scheme? Or does it simply mean you can't claim that particular head of loss? But those issues are eminently triable in this country after, or in parallel with, even, the trial of the liability of the two defendants, which is not going to be decided anywhere else. Um, now, my lord. Um, I haven't, unless I can, unless there are any other questions, I've, I've kept to my 
decided. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Dunning. <coughs> Four minutes to poison our minds, Mr. Gibson. <laughs> um, I would remove your mask to do so. Not your wig. <coughs> my lords, my lady. You haven't got a gown either, but oh. uh, don't worry. I mean, <laughs> you know, you're pretty liberal these days, Mr. Gibson. I was going to ask whether it might be possible for you to have easily at hand the Lord Justice Coulson's reasons uh, and, the, um, and the ground. We have, so, we have them engraved on yes. our hearts, in fact. Uh, and could you also have, if it's convenient, easily at hand our skeleton, which is at... Uh, yeah, we have that too. A32. Those are the three documents we to refer to most. I had been proposing to follow, for the most part, the structure of the skeleton, which addresses the uh, structure of the skeleton that we received. And as you will have seen from that and the allegations that were made, the claimants were firmly putting their case in D1 of their skeleton on the clear basis that Lord Justice Coulson had not read or considered the reasons. Well, that's all changed now. Well, that's my first point. Uh, that appears to have been effectively conceded uh, as a bad point. You've seen from our skeleton why it is manifestly a bad point. Yeah. I won't repeat all the points that we make in our skeleton addressing that. Uh, they identified what they call the six clearest examples uh, and I have been proposing to take you through them to show you why they are bad points on a number of levels, uh, not least because it said points have been dropped, which had not been dropped. Uh, and you've seen in our skeleton, uh, I, I may give you the headline points, points afterwards, but that, that is important because the claimants recognising a high bar of 5230 framed their application, planked it on that basis, and indeed framed their argument in a way which in, in our submission was plainly inappropriate to the facts of this case. And I will come to grappling after lunch, but it's extremely important in our submission uh, to, to just have regard for the way in which they, they, they did frame their application. And we say rightly, because to come within 5230, it is a high bar. In the first instance, they did three things. First, they made a very serious allegation that was completely unfounded. Uh, secondly, they placed great reliance on Supreme Court case of MasterCard and Merricks, which is a Competition Act case, as you've seen. It's not referred to in the lengthy grounds of appeal. It's subject to one sentence in the PTA skeleton of paragraph 34 and is clearly of no significant relevance. And the reason it was identified, which one suspects, is because it brought, potentially brought the claimants within scope of a case like Balwinder Singh, which they also, in my third point, devoted a whole paragraph to and a great deal of reasoning to, in order to convey the impression, no doubt, that this case, uh, where Lord Justice didn't read the um, uh, the grounds, as they alleged, fell within that type of case. And of course, this has absolutely nothing to do with the Bellwinder Singh type of case. Mr. Gibson, can I help you? You're pushing very much at an open door if you are saying that the way this application was framed was not um, correct. Uh, but your time will be better spent after lunch if you meet the contention that is also made in a roundabout way in the skeleton argument before us, 
uh, which is that Mr. Lord Justice Coulson failed to grapple with significant attacks to the judge's judgment. And instead of, and, and this perhaps is a comment, instead of um, tackling the attacks and dealing with them and saying why they were wrong, the approach of the Lord Justice is simply to say the judge was right in every particular. And as I've just enunciated to Mr. Dunning, that can sometimes be a perfectly good approach for a Lord Justice to take. But in this particular case, where it is said that the judge has failed to deal with the major points that make his judgment wrong, it's obviously not enough just to say the judge was right, because you can't be right not to deal with points. You have to say why the points are wrong. So we need to be persuaded that what he did was enough in the context of the cases that Mr. Dunning referred us to, which we have clearly in mind, of Wingfield and Circle and all the cases of Turner, Taylor and Lawrence itself. We need to be persuaded that the judge did enough yes. and appropriately dealt with the points of challenge. Yes. Or to be persuaded that the points of challenge are simply bad in themselves and wouldn't have made any difference at all. And, and so you, you have a, a, a higher task than Mr. Dunning because he, he was told right at the beginning that we happen to think this, this presented a case that had a prospect of, real prospect of success. Yes. Now, um, you're, you're very much open. We, we very much invite you to challenge that. Um, he, I certainly want to hear all you have to say. So I think probably with that, we'll break now and resume at 2 o'clock.